Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Full Goon Squad in the house. Hey, yo. Yo. What's up? On today's episode, we are going to be taking a deep dive into the role that judgment plays within the season of a CrossFit Games athlete. Other people's judgment. Who's allowed to judge you? Do you judge yourself? What can you fucking do about it now that we actually have some runway leading into next season? But before we do that, you can head to sharpentheaxeco.com and use the code word PAGE, P-A-I-G-E. You save 10% on your order and you are giving PAGE 10% as well towards her journey to the CrossFit Games. We still have the Misfit uh, Dervana shirt. Uh, um, <laughs> smells like Misfit we have Spirit. the Misfit uh, King shirt. We got some suffer shirts. We've got some gas up tees. We've got some good stuff there. Um, so head there, use the code word page. We also just got started in a brand spanking new training phase at misfitathletics.com, Hatchet Off Season 2. You can get started on that anytime. You can also head to um, our fitter page and download a free one week preview so that you can take a look and see if it's right for you before getting signed up. Um, we also have Ted. Is it still Misfit Camp? Is that right? Let's see if that still works. That is yeah. correct. Uh, yep. Let's see, we are going to be in Philadelphia. Uh, that does not work. Let's go. The links work. on our social. There's like a big old. Go to our social <laughs> to get the link to go to training camp. I don't have the dates in front of me. October, October eleven to thirteen. Eleven to thirteen. Um, CrossFit raid just outside of Philadelphia, um, already have a, a good, good amount of signups, um, wanted to make sure that we gave first dibs to the, to the discord community, all the people that participate and follow the program, but, um, really, uh, probably the best way to sort of get intertwined into the misfit community. Um, you get to know the coaching staff. We do a pretty deep dive into a bunch of the stuff that we talk about on the podcast, but in a much more intimate setting um, so that you guys can ask questions, um, a lot of movement efficiency tips. Um, but I think the most powerful part of it is connecting with the coaching staff and your fellow misfits. There's something very powerful and different about um, being in a room filled with like-minded people. That's something that doesn't happen super often. Um, so... 30, 40 misfits all in a room together over the course of a weekend. And, and you can really, um, I think, get some, some information and motivation to, to get you into the season. You can also head to teammisfit.com for your affiliate programming needs and properfuel.co for the best supplements in the game. Are you going to say something, Ted? Cut you off? Nope. No. I mean, Good. Do you it. come to camp, there's a bunch of misfits in the room. At the very least, you'll get a workout, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we can get a workout or five A workout or five. That's definitely going to happen. All right, gentlemen, life chat. Sherb, congratulations. You're a world champion for the 18th time. Did you watch any of it? <laughs> yeah, you, yeah I watch. No, I watched uh, every single week through or every, every single game through like the third quarter. But beyond there, what's up, Sean? Sorry, someone walk in. Uh, beyond there, I usually, uh, fourth quarter is just too goddamn late. I'm too old. And I did it for game one of the finals and it affected me till like Thursday and that game was on a Monday. So <laughs> I watched, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I watched through three quarters and then I'm like, I just, hopefully this lead is enough. And last night they were up like 19 or 18 after the third quarter. I think there was like maybe yeah. a minute left and I was like, ah, they got it. And Thankfully, the shots were falling last night to put a fucking end to that game. I, last thing I wanted was to go back to fucking Dallas. Did not want to go back there. You were going to it's, Dallas? Yeah. I was going to say, like you were yeah. traveling. Like, oh, yeah, I can't believe the, I have to go to KP Dallas. KP can't go in. KP couldn't go in, so they were going to put me in. <laughs> He's got a body, Derek Lively. Show him what's what. Get him. But yeah, no, it was a good series. It was a... 
It's a little, a little nervous. When your team relies on the three ball as much as the Celtics do, if they aren't going down early, you start to get pretty nervous. And even with the whatever 15, 18-point lead they had, like – they get lazy at times. They get complacent. They start playing like hero ball. Like I'm just going to dribble down the court and jack a three from 31 feet. And that usually doesn't bode well when you're trying to preserve a lead and not blow it, which has been their MO. Uh, and the games they've lost this season is they were, a lot of those games, they were up 15, 20, 25, and they just let a team like chip away at it, chip away at it, and then they couldn't get themselves back into a groove. And, you know, like game four, they lost by a billion points. So. It's possible still, even when you are a tremendous team. How long is a quarter nice in basketball? See... 12. 12? Yeah. It's nice to see the super team thing. It's been basically fully squashed now. Like, teams keep trying it, and they suck so bad. Like, the Suns. <laughs> the Suns They're on great. paper. And they have that fucking Bradley Beal contract. But I think for sports in general, the idea of people not understanding the role that, like, actual teamwork and coaching and all of that coming together i think the celtics are like the perfect it's also like fitting that they're a boston team blue collar fucking it's cold as fuck kid like bro did you see the fights in this fucking arena when game <laughs> four they gotta stop they were, beating the shit out of each other though they they have a they've been doing party. that the since i was a little kid <laughs> literally not even in the arena it's just a bunch of boston fans in td garden they're in dallas and they're losing by a zillion points and they're just killing each other it's like well fuck we suck let's beat each other up it was you know entertaining but bro you get that bl- that bud light flowing and uh you know fists are not, gonna be flying whatever you and anyone who's listening to this podcast which is basically everyone that's not from the we'll call it greater greater boston area it's just as bad as you think it is. It's great. <laughs> the people, it's... the whole fucking, it's, it's quite a place. It's a very special city. <laughs> it is. I'm Especially glad I'm NFL an playoffs. Half north of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very true. What do you guys have? Anything going on, gentlemen? I have made a purchase. I have not received Congrats. yet. I have not yet received said purchase, but I bought a pellet grill slash smoker. That I'm pretty yeah. excited about. I ended up that getting a dick. Oh yeah, I ended up getting a Rectech instead of a oh, Traeger. What, the fuck? what you do? What you don't want to? You don't want me to get a Rectech? What's, Rec-tech? A Rec-tech? What's up with that? It's just the name. Same, it's same the idea. Brand. I told you about it. You yeah. did? I thought James did. I don't know. My memory's a little fuzzy from the weekend, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm pretty. Why stoked. Ted? Tell us why. <laughs> I don't know. There was like there's a lot of pollen in the air. You know, yeah. my eyes are sad running. movies. Yeah, lots of sad, lots of sad movies. <laughs> sad movies. Yeah, I was coughing a lot. Fuck, why are your eyes closed? This is a sad <laughs> but, movie. But this pellet grill gets up to a thousand degrees. Yo. So Holy I'm going to be fuck. burning some shit on this bitch for yeah. sure. We'll pizza's see. going to be fucking great in that thing. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm really excited. Is that yeah. a temperature you cook pizza at a thousand degrees? Actually, yeah, that's I mean, what you know, I've been doing wrong. Neop- Neapolitan fuck. pizza is usually cooked around 900. I mean, you cook it for like a minute and a half, but yeah, yeah. I've got my uni up to like seven or 800, Ooh, something like that. Toasty. Um, but you have to be careful in those depending on how much of the fire gets up over the top. Mm-hmm. Cause like the big thing is you're cooking obviously the dough at like an incredibly high rate. And that's what gives you like the crust that you're looking for. But if the fire is making it too much up the sides and over, um, you're burning then, toppings. Uh, you, you've got quite the fucking broiler. <laughs> Million degree broiler <laughs> hits the cheese and it gets a little weird. The, just a kiln. Just keep an eye on it. Just keep an eye on it. Don't walk away. He'll be all right. <laughs> be brave. Ted, my, yeah. my recommendation for one of your maiden voyages aside from pizza okay. is um, a like gnocchi, red sauce, pancetta, mozzarella situation. The Ooh. the fucking smoke flavor getting into that dish is like such a game changer, and it gets into the gnocchi better than it does um, pasta. You do this in like a reason. like a casserole dish, yeah. In the yeah. smoker, so you basically you basically put it together like you would if you were just going to finish it in the oven. You want to melt the cheese, get a little broil on it, um, and you throw it in there, um, and it, it like basically already cooked already, like. You're just you're cooking gnocchi for like a very short period of time, but the if you get it pretty smoky, the like 
the sauce completely changes flavor. The mozzarella does. Like it's fucking, it's wild. All right, I'm gonna have to try it. Yep, good stuff. Hunty, why don't you tell the people what you just did? Why you're looking? Oh, a little why do you look up? like that? Yeah. yeah, I'm quite, I'm <laughs> quite got off, wet. Got off the island, <laughs> naked and afraid. Yeah, uh, uh, mid mid summer running check in workout from the affiliate program. <laughs> run a mile, four wall walks, 24 wall balls, run a mile, 24 wall balls, four wall walks, run a mile. Uh, it was similar to the test, the running test that we did for affiliates at the beginning of the summer, and we won't retest it again exactly for another seven or eight weeks, but uh, this was the, also happened to be the first really pretty hot day out here in Maine, hot and humid. It was like it's like 78 and very humid so not like did it at like 10 it was like 10 10 a.m or so so it wasn't dead dead middle of the day but man it's gonna be some sad runners come three three and five p.m for sure it's a different ball they're game not, when you're uh, out there pounding hydrated. the pavement it's not 78 degrees on that fucking tar there's no way you, the no. second yeah, you walk from too. the gym out there into the sun on the tar it's like 80s yeah, that six thirty yeah, class is sure. gonna be pretty sad about that, huh? Yep. Yeah, I got <laughs> yeah deep into the weeds on the whole fucking dew point thing when Sherb and I were doing all that running a couple summers ago. It's like there's a few running blogs that have charts that show you how many seconds per mile you lose in long duration stuff when the dew point rises. So that's that what happened like on the marathon. That's is what that just the amount of humidity in the air, the dew point? Yeah, it's something. <laughs> let's, 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 let's it's a suck point. index. <laughs> it's going to suck more outside. Dew point is the temperature the air needs to be cooled at in order to achieve relative humidity of 100%. But. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> uh-huh. Hunter, you're an engineer. Tell us what that means. I kind of blacked out while you were saying the definition. <laughs> All right, let's Basically, try this one more time. The temperature the air needs to be cooled to in order to achieve relative humidity of 100%. What's the current dew point? Do we know? Are you able to look up the current dew point in Portland, Maine? 10. <laughs> I don't think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the humidity is 78%, and the dew point is 55.9, so that's actually not too bad. So, so the, you so would the cool air the air to, to be 55, cooled. and it would be 100% humidity? Does. We need some big fans if we're getting this bitch down to 55 so the lower, or 90 degrees. So the lower the dew point, the greater the humidity? That's not what I thought. I thought it was higher dew point, higher humidity. Guys. Well, if it were if it were a if it's seventy eight degree if it's seventy eight degrees out and it were Welcome a to our weather podcast. Dew point. <laughs> okay, okay, hold on. The dew point is of a given body of air is the temperature at which it needs to be cooled to become saturated with water vapor. Temperature depends on the pressure and water content in the air. When the air is cooled below the dew point, its moisture capacity is reduced. All right. And <laughs> it makes perfect sense now. I get it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> head into Discord if uh, you're a meteorologist and you want to tell us what dew point is. Yeah, it has something to do with air and vapor and temperature and humidity. Do okay? you? Yeah. Anyways, when, you're, uh, when your dew point is high, you're supposed to reduce your mile pacing, supposedly. It's dangerous. Yeah. What is a high dew point? Um, <laughs> like 30. <sighs> That sound right? <laughs> I feel like 70 is a high dew point. If I remember correctly, I think 70 is pretty bad. What is a high dew point? <laughs> oh, we're killing it right Any now. Any dew point higher than Greater... 61 degrees will begin to make the air feel heavier and uncomfortable. Becomes sticky. I remember <laughs> it getting up near 70 in like July and August. I remember that. It's fucking gnarly. You can tell. The air just feels... Like, there's, it, there's nothing in it. It's a nice, wet bathrobe. Yes. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> you want to know what it's like? Get your bathrobe wet. Wear it around. Yep. 
do that. All right, why don't we uh, jump into today's topic? How about Wet that? bathrobes. Wet bathrobes. <laughs> All right, um, so leading into semifinals, I went a little bit of a different route in terms of like rah-rah speeches and talking to athletes, the misfit athletes that qualified um, about their mental game. And I did uh, voice notes. I actually tried to do videos, but the first video that I shot was too big to send. So I had to upload it to iCloud and then it wasn't loaded yet when the athletes clicked. It was a fucking shit show. Um, we we got to figure it out though. And so I went to the voice notes and just a little bit of background there. Um, from a coaching and athlete perspective, and this will actually help people in their personal life as well if you um, think about it a little bit. So one of the things that you have to do in a position of leadership or coaching is learn to speak other people's languages. Um, and it's really just about forms of communication. So some athletes are going to be comfortable with you coming at them with like guns a-blazing, like we're going to have this super serious, deep conversation and they're going to be able to be open and honest with you in the moment, especially if you have a rapport with them. Some athletes are going to shut down when you ask them questions like that and kind of put them on the spot. So learning how someone is going to be more willing to be open and have a certain conversation, um, even if it's kind of the opposite of what your language is. So some athletes will give you a very like deep drawn out response on something, but they need it to be typed out. I got to send it in a text. I got to send it in a discord message an email, whatever it is. Um, and I think some of that has to do with just communication style. And some of that has to do with not feeling like you're putting them on the spot. Like I'm going to come at you with this emotionally charged thing and I expect a response in the moment. Um, so thinking about that and then you can flip it in the other direction. Um, just making it clear with other people what your preferred communication style is in certain modes. So like for me personally, um, both letting people know, but then also knowing that I am often in a position of leadership or coaching, um, I don't like serious conversations via written methods. They scramble my fucking brain. So like if I'm having like a conversation via text, and I'm like at work and my wife is like sending like text, 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 just boom, 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 fucking rapid fire going through my brain scrambles. I short circuit and I fall off the earth um, and die. And same thing with like super serious business conversations. But in that same mode, you have to understand who wants to have conversations in that way and figure out what the best course of action is. So all of that to say that's where a lot of the voice memo thing came from when talking to the semifinals athletes of like, I'm going to give them an opportunity to hear this, think about it in their own personal context, and then we can have a conversation about it when it's a little bit more kind of digested. And I don't know if you guys have dealt with this with different athletes, um, figuring out what communication style they have. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting to, it's definitely something that if you're going to work with an athlete, that wants to compete at a high level, you have to figure it out over the course of that sort of first season that you're working together. That's what the first three to six months of any remote coaching relationship is, is figuring out how you both communicate, the rhythm at which you want to communicate, what is valuable to both you and the athlete. And you know, a big reason why the contracts are what they are, like why they're not month to month, is that you got to learn who this person is, how they communicate. If you hope to make any sort of real progress with them, you need to find a way to be an effective communicator. And that is a learning curve you have to adjust to in the first few months, which is why, you know, the contracts are what they are. Yeah, I think the your last point about the written versus just having a conversation with someone's a pretty important one. And that's, uh, to be honest, I would usually <laughs> rather have a text conversation, even though I know the perils of, you know, sending a written text message where the other end one there's obviously no there's no literal voice attached to that but there's no there's no inflection there's no understanding of exactly the tone of voice that's being used so anytime that you know any anybody who's ever had like a heated conversation with a a loved one a spouse or whatever via text message knows how easy it is to for those messages to just get scrambled i think 
texting has probably fucking killed more relationships <laughs> than than human stupidity has. Uh, but anyway, I think that's a that's a really important point, is especially when you're any any time there's you know emotions involved, and we're, whether we're talking about something more personal or you know coaching athletes, then the you know a that's why I like to I try to FaceTime like I whenever Kelly and I chat usually FaceTime uh, my other athletes usually it's over the phone when it's when it's not you know the kind of mundane day to day text message exchange scores videos that sort of thing but if it's a more serious conversation it's it's like hey let's carve out some time to to at, le- at the very least have a a voice conversation so that we can actually hear you know the nuances of dialogue as opposed to being someone being able to nitpick and pick apart sentences and words and well you said this but and then you're like well i meant this and you know it, the tone of, like all all those little things make a huge difference that written word misses out on especially if it's supposed to be dialogue sure yeah so i figured <clears throat> in this context with it being a group of athletes one of the easiest ways that i could give them space to figure it out um in terms of what it meant to them specifically but also not get certain things lost in translation was the voice memo um and i definitely found that the more of them that i did the more comfortable that i was with it because it is odd not having any feedback whatsoever like can't hear yourself you're like is this even being recorded like that kind of thing so um the more i did it the the more comfortable i got with it so I think the opening discussion is very wide ranging and and kind of complicated, especially because of some of the conversations that have taken place in the CrossFit space over the last few years in regards to athletes feeling too much pressure and essentially quitting. Um, And we see it on a pretty regular basis with potentially lower stakes is the only way that I can really think to explain it. And it's just that idea of we've been training all year. We've been, you know, doing the work and checking the boxes and, you know, making adaptations on the physical side, the mental side, um, you know, building the habits. But then as we get closer to this moment where you are going to be potentially criticized um, and potentially scored. Um, You know, you have a literal leaderboard that's going to tell you something. Um, Athletes get really sort of wrapped up in that and can forget in a very big way what they have accomplished over the course of the year. So the questions that I asked the athletes, um, and I gave them what I thought my answer was, was when is judgment day? So if you're doing this as an exercise for yourself leading into the 2025 season, first question is, when is judgment day? And the second question is, who is qualified to judge you? So before I give my definitions, I don't know if anything in particular comes to mind with you guys. Can you ask it one more time? Yep. When is judgment day? So in their minds, in a lot of people's minds, judgment day is, you know, May 29th, three, two, one, go. Um, and then who is qualified to judge you? Who is allowed to say you can make it, you can't make it. If you do make it, then your life is complete. And if you don't make it, then you're a fucking scrub, etc. I don't think life is that like binary <laughs> when it comes to this stuff. I do think that's sure, where most, most, most athletes' heads go to. It's either pass or fail, A or F. I just don't think it works that way. And I think it's a really rough way to live your life. But I do think that's the reason why you see so many people not able to cope with the stress of, of trying really hard for something and not succeeding. And succeeding just meaning like creating that binary, yes, I did it, or no, I didn't do it thing. So, I mean, it's hard to have that conversation with athletes. It's honestly something that happens just about every single year with a handful of athletes that I work with is that you're going to have a conversation with them. And it's like, Hey, you made a lot of progress. I know you came up short of your goal. That doesn't mean what we did this last year was a waste of time. We just 
need so to that's realize one that response that I got sure that that was that was very big is is all of that that I did this year what if it was a waste I just for me it's like why would you choose to look at it that way that's a that's a weird perspective to have on a lot of time spent like who would who would sign up for something that they know is going to be difficult that has a relatively low success rate with the mindset of like, if I don't do this, I'm a failure. That just seems like a really challenging way to live your life and not a, not a fortuitous one. You know what I mean? You're not going to go far in life at that. That's how you determine <laughs> whether or not you are a successful or non-successful human being. It's just a weird, I don't know. Do you have to not, start? Not very articulate right now, but it's just, it's just weird to me that's how you want to like phrase or frame your mindset around a goal of yours. Well, and, and I think that it makes sense that it doesn't compute for you because you train pretty fucking hard because you want to, because you want to be healthy, because you want to do hard things, because you want to set an example for your kids, because you want to set an example for your community, because you want to know that in the face of adversity that you can respond. We know we get to sit in these chairs and talk about it. We know that it's not a fucking waste. Like, Hunter, if you didn't win that workout today, is that should you have not done the workout? Like, like a lot of this stuff, when you're not put into the spotlight in those moments, doesn't compute for us. And I think it's a coach's job. It is a you know um, your circle of people, your tribe, your community. It's their job to remind you over the course of an entire year that you're choosing to do this. Like. If you were only doing it for the gratification of that single moment, I don't think you'd make it all year. I don't think you'd get up at 5 a.m. I don't think you'd go back in for those fucking rowing intervals because you didn't get them done after work. Like those sorts of things. I don't I think... I always see him do his rowing intervals. Hunter's always doing his rowing intervals. I don't I'm think always that that fire... I think that's a very quick, hot-burning fuel. And I don't think it lasts you in off-season. So if that's your only goal... If that's the only thing you're trying to do is to get people who get paid um, money to create clickbait videos about who's going to qualify for certain competitions and then the CrossFit Games leaderboard, if that's the only reason you do what you do, I don't think you can accomplish very much. Yeah, I think that's where I was kind of going to get started was that the, like, the... <sighs> Judgment day and who can judge you is the answer to that question, I think, is much more dependent on how well you defined success for yourself to begin with and the rationale for why you are embarking on what you're doing. Uh, and I agree with you that I think that the it's too fast burning to say what what's your what was your, what was your example drew what you said was was kind of spot on it was just like the the instantaneous gratification of whether exactly. it's qualification sure it's like the that that has to ha that has to have a, a second layer to it it's like i want to qualify for semifinals well why why do you want to qualify for semifinals well to to be the best well why do you want to be the best because well, because i didn't make varsity hockey as a junior like oh okay now we're getting somewhere and we have to like part of that role of the coach is to dig into that a little bit to assign because one of the i i think it i think it's really i'm not a particularly religious person i know none of you guys are but there is a i i think it would be kind of silly to ignore the frequency at which you see professional athletes um Scotty Scheffler being one that comes to mind just because I've paid more attention to golf recently. But after his two weekends ago, he was, you know, trying to win a second major championship and he got arrested for what ended up being a, a pretty ridiculous scenario. But in his post inner in his post, you know, uh post round interviews, he he just he repeatedly talked about giving credit to God. And again, not to turn this into a sermon here, but he he also said like where I place this weekend was irrelevant because my place has already been set in God's eyes, for example. So what, again, det detach that from the, the literal religious Christian notion that you might have and observe the idea that Scotty Scheffler is saying that I have 
I have a higher like purpose. There is something that is undergirding my efforts to be as good as I can. And whether that's, you know, to glorify God, like, okay, great. Clearly that is a powerful enough thing that there are, you know, scores of professional athletes who are, who make a very similar statement, who look up, you know, at the sky and do the, the cross when, when they score a touchdown or, you know, any, any example like that, I think there's, there's a much deeper reason for that than just like, I'm a religious per it's people, people aren't just screaming. Like, I love God. I'm a religious person. It's like, I am, I have, I am making a sacrifice to something that's greater than myself. And that in turn is the purpose. So the judgment in, in, you know, for Scotty, for example, is probably literally, he might think like, well, only God can judge me. And in a way that provides a, you know, just kind of a, a, something for the athlete, something for the, the athlete, the competitor, whatever, to rely on and kind of hang their hat on from a daily basis. Because if it's just like you said, I want to qualify, that's an extremely low resolution, not like not, it's just not, doesn't have any depth to it. And there's a, you know, that's the kind of thing where people just waver back and forth. There, there needs to be some depth to, before we start talking about judgment. Yeah. My, my response to the athletes, I think, can be connected to your response, Hunter, pretty easily. Um, if we dumb it down to a value system from what you said, just to what do That's I... That's what it is. Yeah. Right? What do I stand yeah. for as a human being? What was the point of that book that was written, whether it was written by a higher power or, or not? Just this idea of if we're going to survive and thrive as a species, we need to have values. We can't like fall back to, you know, our evolutionary urges and things of that nature. Um, so my response to the athletes was judgment day has come and gone. You know, we're, it's June right now. Almost every misfit athlete is done competing until 2025 in the CrossFit Games season structure anyways. So you now reset the clock on Judgment Day. And again, Judgment Day is when your alarm goes off at 5 a.m. because you have a job, do you get up and go train? Judgment Day is, again, I had rowing intervals to do and I didn't get them done in the time and now I have to go coach a bunch of classes Am I going to say, well, I don't think I can get them in, or am I going to go back in and do them? Judgment day is the absolute worst day of your entire off season. Are you still going to go train? You're in a dog shit mood because of the way that the lift went or the workout went and a member in your gym that looks up to you, walks up to you and asks you if you can help with their handstand walking or whatever. Someone asks you, depending again on your value structure, can you help me move this weekend? It doesn't really matter what it is um, aside from the fact that it needs to line up with the type of person that you're trying to be. Judgment day occurs over and over and over until you come up against the thing and have the ability to turn around and look at it. And some people don't get up when the alarm goes off and some people don't go back into the gym and some people snap at the member that asks them for help. And maybe there's a reason why that level of insecurity lives there. But we see a lot of athletes check so many of those boxes. You know, we've talked about the maturity meter in the past. We could expand on this, you know, forever. Um, but we've seen so many athletes rise to the occasion, to the occasion every time Judgment Day came up and then still think, that these other people or these other entities should have the ability to judge them as a human. And we have to get over that. So we're that is something away. It, it really is. It is. And we can, it's, it's not like one of the, you know, one of the spoiler alert for later in the episode is this idea of who your harshest critic is. We can all understand intuitively how an athlete ends up in this place. How do they end up in this mindset? They do what they're supposed to do all year long but they still believe that some external force has the ability to decide whether they are worth it 
or whether their pursuit was worth it. Um, so I think that that is just so incredibly important. And before we get to that point, I want to go to the second question and ask who is qualified to judge you. If you are going to attach your self-worth to the judgment of other people, who is allowed to do so? Who has man permission to comment on that? The man in the mirror. And what I Anybody mean by else? that is just Michael just Jackson? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. I mean the yeah, the the obvious one is like it's just myself and that's it's I was like, but it could be your circle, how can right? I answer this question. Well, yeah, I was gonna. So the 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 secondary is like, hopefully that if you've actually legitimately, and legitimately want to go down this path of you know, the the training or what you're gonna establish a goal, you're gonna make sure your values line up with that goal, whatever. Um, it's probably not just you, right? There 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 should be. Maybe maybe it's for your own accountability. You know, it's a coach. It's somebody like you. You need to you hire a coach because you expect that coach to not only provide you with the training, but in some regards to hold you accountable. You create a a group text with a couple friends who are who are training or have the same goal, or you you know you jump in the Discord server or whatever it is. But you part of it is is like it, it we human beings are extremely bad at holding themselves accountable to something that they established for themselves alone we're much better at holding each other accountable for things especially if you've agreed you've made a you know an agreement with other people where you're going to hold them accountable you're going to hold them you know they're going to hold you accountable it's the same reason people manage to go harder in the partner workout versus the team workout because they don't want to or versus the individual workout because they don't want to let their partner or let their team down uh it's not about you it's about what am i doing what am i going to sacrifice in order to for, you know for the betterment of the team so certainly like the 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 last line of defense is the guy in the mirror but they're you know that that's not it you should i think it's necessary to assign you know, have other people who can hold you accountable and can call you out and say, no, like that wasn't good enough. Like get the fuck back out there, do your rowing intervals or do them tomorrow. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. I think it helps you audit your circle too. If you don't like what you're hearing or, and it's not conducive to your growth. Like obviously it's fine to have someone there who's a harsh critic and gives you feedback that you need to hear. But it's also a good way to audit your circle. Like if you don't trust those opinion people to give For you sure. a good opinion, like it's a really easy way to to potentially eliminate them from that part of your life. I'm not saying like you need to like you know, stop being friends with them, but maybe they're not someone you talked with about whatever goal you're working towards. This is just not the person you go to anymore. You find someone else that puts wind in your sails as opposed to in your face. Yeah, and the these judgments that we're talking about are bite sized. They're little snacks every single day, which makes them binary. So if you have that person in your life that is literally creating an alternate version of reality, then they also don't get, they don't get a say in what's going on. Like if they're making comments about you not working hard and you are doing the things that you're asked to, to, to do and you're you know, sort of lining up your goals with your um, you know, priorities and all of that stuff, or are you know projecting their own personal character traits onto you, that sort of thing, they're not on the list. They don't get to be there. Um, so to me, this question of who is, is qualified to judge lines up very well with when is judgment day. Who's around to see the way that you act and behave on a regular basis, how hard you work, how you treat other people, all of the values um, that could be built into something that you've created on your own, could be religious, could be family values that have been instilled in you. You know, maybe you were in the, in the military, you know, maybe, you know, did martial arts, whatever it is, the things that resonate with you as a human being set up that structure for you to go execute on. And the people in your life should be able to either, you know, when it is time for you to go do the big showcase we you know we flip the scales a little bit and you know they carry you around and they support you just like you did for them all year um that those are the things that we have to make known and make very normal within this community 
It was Atlas Games. What year were we at Atlas Games? 21? 21. Or 22? 21. Wasn't it the year after you drove up there and then had to drive back? No, no. Granite was first, I, actually. I think it was. It was Granite point. first. And then Ew. Atlas. Yeah. Um, and just like full disclosure here, I don't know this person, um, but you know, there's been, uh, recently some media surrounding and actually one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast kind of indirectly about Emma Lawson being sort of pulled into that, um, you know, attaching a lot of who she is as a person and her worth with what the expectations of the greater community at large um wants from her and i've i've talked about this before with a lot of different coaches and athletes i don't know if i've talked about called out specific people on the podcast you guys can um remind me or not but i'm obsessed with body language with like just this idea of what happens when someone is sure of their abilities in a competitive setting and i think either the first or second place all time best body language I've ever seen was Emma Lawson at the uh, Atlas games. That was something to fucking behold. And it was kind of interesting because we were going into it and you know, our goal, Caroline's goal was to win. And basically all of her main competitors there were teens that were aging up. So you don't really know what the level of competition was going to be. Um, and she set the tone very early, but she would just, she'd warm up, she'd do her thing. And then she'd go sit on that concrete, um, that big concrete Wait. thing that they used to have that would, you know, basically strap down the, the mini rig that they had. Um, and the look on her face was just like, basically just like the rest of you are fucked. <laughs> like she didn't say anything. She wasn't like boastful or bragging, but so locked in. And especially at that age, I was just like, this is like absolutely incredible. So there's a part of me that's like, like heartbroken a little bit at the idea that someone that has, you know, manifested and turned themselves into this person um, now has to go through and almost work backwards and, and take some steps back because of the level of judgment that is cast on them by entities that I personally believe have no fucking say in how you should be judged. Do you have any like, more specifics on that, Drew? I, I, I'm not tracking on the, I, I've, I mean, I've, aside from watching some of that, that happened to some of the younger teens in the last like year or two. I don't know. If no, I don't, any, like, I, I don't want to speculate. Not, it's not, more not to just, go specifics. Or, yeah. It's, it's, it's more yeah. just the idea that the atmosphere of, you know, it's, I'm sure it's very complicated. You're yeah. a, a, a young woman in the world. You're a young woman in the sport. But then, you know, you're, you're being compared to the, the greatest CrossFitter that's ever lived. And, you know, Laura's, you know, in the top five. You know what I mean? Like, you're being compared to these people. And there's a level of expectation that's being put onto someone that, you know, obviously is having a very serious effect on multiple different athletes. And it's just such a bummer um, for, I, I don't know. I mean, I, just the reasons that I've stated, I mean, she's super nice to all of the other athletes in the back. She's, she's always had a very good reputation. Um, so to hear that is just, it's, it's super challenging and it just makes me want to, to talk about this stuff and put it out there. Like you're yeah, going to, I mean, know I think, deep down. I think this is, I think it's, largely the nature of crossfit itself because it's one we're referring to an individual an individual athlete and it's i would it seems to be like i don't know how many team athletes have been in the same boat but it has largely seemed to affect a similar kind of vibe you know haley it happened to haley adams a, you know a year or two ago going through what seems like a similar thing this is an individual athlete not to mention the like the, you could take this down like seven different rabbit holes for like four miles like young teenage woman who is an elite athlete being compared to you know the best crossfitter of all time uh is competing in a sport where on every any given day that person is 
entirely accessible by literally anybody who walks into that gym. So wherever she trains, she has constant, probably has continue like constant eyes on her or is at least at the very least accessible to people who want to talk to her about that. When you compare that against a professional sports team where there's a there's a bubble, there's essentially like a bubble around athletes where it's like, you know, we are we you, we go to the arena like we do things as a team we travel as a team we train as a team i'm not going to foley's fitness with you know the fucking boston bruins to go train where tom dick and larry can come and talk to me about crossfit or whatever and i'm not saying that's bad i'm just saying it's a unique element of our sport where these people who have the potential to go from no name to you know crossfit games athlete elite status whatever uh is are ultimately at the end of the day just kind of walking amongst the mortals and like that sort of pressure especially for a young again young woman who dominated the teen division and then is showing no signs of slowing down or was showing no signs of slowing down uh there's a lot there's a lot of uh idiosyncrasies i guess would be the right word uh in the in the CrossFit space specifically for that reason. And the sport is so young that it's, we're like, we're go, we went from like, oh yeah, like Annie did her first muscle up at the 2009 CrossFit games to now it's like, you know, people are, athletes Well, you have broke to, the 15? Uh, yeah, to, yeah, to like, and then to, to Tia who has to walk around with like four or five people like around her because she's Tia Toomey and we are seeing like that, like happen in real time like these athletes becoming more relevant i guess would i would say in real time uh compared to like your professional the you know nba nfl those the professional athletes of the more traditional sports but and it's it's all happening in real time and these are people who or just you know came into the gym to work out and they found out that they were good at something and it's like i'm not a fucking professional athlete but it's maybe you are uh and like that's a landscape that nobody knows how to t- how, knows how to do other than professional athletes who've been doing it for a while and maybe they don't even fucking know how to do it I and mean, look now. at their <laughs> support structure look at their the family that surrounds the athlete that's something you hear about with emma and her dad and her parents being involved in their training but in a manner that seems to be constructive to her development whereas you don't hear the same thing about some of the other names in the sport and their family and how they that support system may have been not the best. I mean, you're obviously just guessing it's conjecture whether or not you think that they're beneficial or not. But, you know, the, the history of what I've seen in the whatever, 11 or so years that been part of the, the sports side of CrossFit is that the ones that seem to stick it out and continue to train and enjoy training and then continually get better have a relationship that's not outcome dependent with their parents or it doesn't feel like the outcome is determines their relationship with their parents and again parents aren't the only answer you know it could be friends it could be coaches it could be outside that circle but the circle around the person and understanding you know kind of who is allowed to be and not be the critic um i think there are athletes that are young up and coming who attach too much of their identity to the outcome of their performance on the floor instead of the work that they put in and under, and misunderstand the greater lesson that the gym has to provide them. And that can only be amplified or turned down by the support structure around them. So if you have a very volatile athlete that is dependent on getting attention based on their performance and then they don't perform well, they lose that attention and then that they can equate that with their self-worth and that's the athlete that no longer wants to compete in the sport. So, I mean, I'm just an anecdotal evidence here based on the few that I've known in the past that I would say that their home life growing up, you know, going into CrossFit or while they were in CrossFit wasn't the most conducive to success are the athletes who attach their identity to their outcome. And as a result, if they don't do well or they have some struggles, they're like, I'm good. I'm going to go do something else. Yeah. And that, Unfortunately, that landscape is can be more complicated than and than that, depending on what you, sports you grew up playing, and again, who was allowed to be the judge, who was allowed to be the critic. 
Like, I think all of us grew up in fairly similar, you know, areas and situations in regards to sports. And there was no hiding the fact that it was social currency for parents to have a kid who not only excelled at sports, but the lessons were often, oh, he does it so effortlessly. Can you believe he can just like, he doesn't, you know, train at all in the off season and he picks up a hockey stick and he's X or he, you know, goes to the soccer field and he can do this. That level of pressure on a kid, whether it's from friends, parents, coaches, other parents, you know, that sort of thing. Um, starting at, I mean, it can start all the way down at T-ball, right? So you still have three to five years left of very serious development in terms of how you interpret the world. Um, and that idea of self-worth can be manipulated and played with. And while we can have these conversations and hopefully, hopefully dig into this stuff with our athletes, it doesn't mean it's not going to be there. Like one of the most counterintuitive responses that I get to these questions is I have all of these people that believe in me more than I believe in myself and I don't want to let them down. And we really have to go over the fact that they have a ton of people that believe in them because of who they are as a person. Because again, like if, if you have an incredibly small circle, um, in these moments and you don't have a bunch of people that you quote unquote would be letting down, then there's a good chance that you're not the easiest person to, to deal with. You, you know, ride those waves, the high highs and the low lows in a lot of instances. Um, so you have to bring it back with these athletes who are so worried about letting a, a large group of people down and be like, you have a large group of people in your corner. What did it take for you to get that many people to want to fucking travel to God knows where and watch you exercise. Like, mm -hmm. like it's not the leaderboard. It's not whether fucking Joe Schmo thinks you're going to qualify. Um, it's the fact that they believe in you as a human being. And even if you were super fit, if you're a fucking dickhead, like you're probably not getting that many people that are traveling to where you're going. So like they have this, this like, undeniable stack of proof that they are, you know, you know, should have self-worth. All of these people believe in you and it ends up working out in the heat of the moment to be a negative because it's like, they're all here. What if I fail? And it's like, you had to be the like 63rd fittest man or woman on earth to, to be here. It's fucking insane. Like everyone yeah, just be keeps a weird... moving their goalposts. It would be a weird circumstance if that, that was what it was. Like, oh, we're here for you to only win. And if you don't win, like, fuck, why are we wasting our time here? I right. feel like that's obviously self-created and not a realistic thing. But, oh, I just flew in my mouth. Gross. Ugh. Yeah. Lunch. Ugh, fuck. What did it taste you like? Update your macros. Ugh, it's two grams of protein. Uh, yeah, it's just okay. a weird thing for me to, to think about someone like, it's obviously a real but you've thing. Seen athletes it, right? feel, yeah, athletes yeah. feel that. It's just a strange thing to be, you know, <laughs> worried about. Like, ah, fuck! My parents hate me because I came in third. Like, yep, you're right. That you, you got it. Your that's parents, correct. If if that's real, your parents aren't <laughs> fucking invited next year. That's all. Yeah, I have for to say real. About Jesus that. Christ. Yeah, and that, and honestly, that brings me back a little bit to the old days of the programs, the different programs that would show up because someone said that they followed their program or because they paid them $500 and gave them a t-shirt even though they didn't follow their program. Remember those days? Um, oh, yeah. And what they would do Last is they year? would pay someone <laughs> This year, probably. <laughs> they would pay somewhat close attention to the athlete to get a feel for whether they could get that photo at the end with their arm around them after they were on the podium. And legitimately, some of them would only have a couple athletes, and they would leave the event by Sunday. They would be gone. Or... In a lot of instances, you just see they stop paying attention to them completely. You got to think about how that would fucking make a human being feel. Like, I'm so excited to meet you. This is awesome. Here's this box of t-shirts. We really believe in you. Oh, you're in 27th? I don't... I don't Give us that t-shirt back. <laughs> right? Like, oh man, stuff like that drives me fucking nuts. We, Austin and I were joking in the back at semifinals um, 
the the event that he thought he would struggle the most in one of the um one of the people that you know says who's going to qualify and again whether you should have any self-worth or not chose him as the dark horse um to win the event and austin and i joke because he had done it before and the other guy came cl- in close to last um and austin and i were joking that he didn't know what dark horse meant and that he was predicting that Austin was going to come in last in the event. And again, this is a conversation that you could only have with someone like Austin. But I just, I was like, hey, bro, I know you're worried about this event, but you actually just got picked as the dark horse to win it. And he's like, what the fuck? Why? And I was like, who knows, man? What a, what a and then, detrimental performance by and Austin. Then he, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fuck. And then he goes, I don't think he knows what dark horse means. I was like, yeah, he actually has been correct if he thinks dark horse means that they're going to come in last. So yeah, just to oh, just to throw Austin. a little shade on that. Because like how often they discuss athletes that are, you know, making that transition from like perennial games or semifinals athlete to masters or team or whatever it is, but because the name is there and they know that they're going to get more views, they spend 30 minutes on that athlete. I'm not saying that that athlete's not fucking awesome and still fit as hell, but like there's if they just talk about the people that they think are going to qualify based on actual numbers, but they don't have the like name recognition and the power to keep people on their YouTube channel or their Instagram channel or their Patreon or whatever it is, probably not going to go very well. So like those get thrown out immediately to me. Like what, why are we paying attention to this? I mean, I think that's a decent reason and something for an athlete listening to this to think about and to recognize that like, this is it's the same every single professional sport like people know a fraction of a percent of a percent of athletes in a given sport and the only people that people know are the biggest names the ones who are just who are the be- probably the the best of the best of the best the majority of athletes at a professional level those names will never like make it into a household they will never be these like these huge names maybe they will for like a year it's like holy shit like what's the who's the dude who at granite games who snatched like 350 and then like yeah it's like it's like you get a so a name like that gets thrown around for like 12 minutes this person's instagram following explodes and then like 12 minutes later it's like that person takes 30th in the running workout and it's like ah he's not important anymore and it's the it's probably the nature of our current you know the current attention span and social media and the you know especially crossfit is so heavily uh like it's so heavily uh inundated with vloggers and nonsense like that where it's so easy <laughs> to get plus yeah, on <laughs> uh, sorry i mean it's fucking goddamn waste of time um <laughs> but it, you get plucked you get plucked out as a name whether it's for good or bad and that that little bit of pressure or that little bit of acknowledgement whatever it is for you has such a significant effect on can have a huge effect on the athlete but for you know the person who throws that out there that's just like i forgot i like two weeks to a day later it's like i forgot i even said that about that person so it's like the athlete has to understand that like at the end of the day they are a like the sound the sound i feel like i'm digging myself a hole here but in a way kind of a a cog in the system that is provides you know uh media outlets with things to talk about that provides spectators with entertainment that provides fellow competitors with you know equally equally competitive peers to compete against but at the end of the day like if you don't have a solid foundational reason support structure whatever for doing what you're doing i think it's you're going to find that even if you manage to make that get on the podium or get close to it, it's like that is such a fleeting moment of success that it's like, and I promise like two weeks later, like I, I we've asked this before. Sure. Do you know who came in fourth place in the, uh, in the, in the West regional? Frank Men, Frankenstein. Male. Yeah, exactly. It's like, and I could have asked him that three days after regionals semifinals occurred. And it's like, I, it's, not to say that it's not important. It's just athletes should. We have to recognize that if you want to have the most uh, 
impactful and meaningful experience of trying to train and qualify for a high level, going for the glory is almost certainly the wrong path. Unless you are the, you know, the chosen one, which you're probably not statistically, <laughs> like it's that's that's just how it is. Um, yeah. And yeah, maybe that'll leave relieve stress from somebody who thinks that just like all these I because I feel that too. Like I what your what your explanation, Drew, I was like Drew's talking about me. It's like someone who's like oh, I hope I don't let these people down. It's has it's never never thought to myself like. Man, I hope Why I do really they care? do well at this. It's like I hope they. I. I don't know. I don't know all these people. I. I think they're all just staring at me, and I think they're <laughs> waiting for me to fail or to do something wrong, or they're judging every single thing that I say and do. And like, I hate this. Fuck that. And that's almost never the case. But right. Like, I mean, I've like I've felt that. Yeah, a, like I said, I mean, I, one of the reasons why this topic has always made so much sense to me, and I've tried to to talk other athletes through it and not, not try to project my own shit is because it's rampant. It's, it's the norm. If you grew up in like a suburban area, you know, it's fucking first world problems, yeah, but it's, it's very much like amplified. Like, yeah. Thousand X since. So is everyone media. super impressed with me? Why am I wondering that when I'm seven? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> not like, I should be fucking eating bugs. Right, yeah, Sheriff? Like, fucking eating some bugs. Ants. bugs. Ants. Right? Them. Um, They're yeah, so, bugs. so so just to Disgusting. wrap up that thought, the, the media side of things is entertainment. Right? That's the point of it. They are trying to get eyeballs. They're trying to get people to watch. They want to be entertained. And that's fine. Right? Like, I watch a bunch of it. There's little nuggets of of information in there that, that you can take. I have absolutely no issue with them making that, but they're not on the fucking list of people who are allowed to judge my athletes. They're just not there. And if I have to bring that up over and over and over, I will. And that includes the other direction, right? Like all of this stuff includes the other side of this, the side that would quote unquote be fun. They don't get to judge you in either situation. They don't get to tell you that you're the greatest human being on earth only to tell you a year later that you suck again because <laughs> they weren't there because they didn't see what you did. And that's the same goes for the leaderboard as it does for those critics. The people that you decide, you have your value system that you you know really think about and really create, you set your goals, and then you have your team around you that makes sure that you get done what you say you're going to. And those are the people that are allowed to judge you. Now, final topic is your harshest critic, as many people say, and just this idea of, are you allowed to judge yourself? And there could be multiple answers to this, depending on, you know, which personality is at the forefront. Oof. That's tough, because if your self-talk isn't positive, you probably shouldn't be your critic. <laughs> your own worst critic. That's a hard hard thing to determine and not a an easy answer to come up with you got to do a lot of work on yourself if you're going to end up being the kind of person that can judge yourself because people are fucking brutal to themselves in a lot of oh, situations yeah. really fucking mean to themselves they give they cut a, other people a ton of slack in a lot of areas and not themselves at all so Again, really complicated topic. You have to have these conversations with your coach, significant other, friends, parents, community members, those people that are allowed to be the critic to, again, set the standards for what it is. Because at the end of the day, a lot of this stuff is done in the shadows, right? So much of this stuff, you're going to be the only one that knows. But you have to, again treat it as a binary situation. These outcomes are you deciding whether you're going to get up and get out of bed when you're supposed to, whether you're going to fucking count your macros, do all of these things that you need to do to achieve your goal. So many of them are done in the shadows. So if you're, again, still incredibly worried about what other people think and you put on a show in the spotlight and then regress back to a not-so-great place in the shadows, 
then that person is allowed to judge you if you've set the goal and you're not checking those boxes off. But again, we talked about maybe how you could have that other voice in the back of your head, even though you're doing the right things. And it still can take over because again, when you were, you know, seven, eight years old, you couldn't kick a soccer ball the same as the kid who had the fucking growth spurt first. And now you're a fucking loser. Like, <laughs> like if you're still, if that's still baked in back there and you haven't addressed it and you haven't talked through it, you haven't realized how silly it is. You don't have the ability to fucking laugh about it. Um, then you might need some help, um, in, in determining again, how much of your, that self-talk is allowed to enter into the equation. Yeah. I just don't I think you'll let the, that in. Yeah. I mean, I think to answer the original question, you should be, and you have to be your own critic. The severity of that is obviously the, that's the meter that we're referring to, right? So if we're 90% negative judgment, negative self-talk with the occasional 10% pat on the back, obviously that's not tenable. In a similar vein, if a, you know, if a, an assessment of Emma Lawson that, you know, we look at a 10 minute workout that she did and all of a sudden there's a media piece that's, you know, a, te- a five minute read that says this is Emma Lawson and this is the judgments of Emma Lawson and her fitness level. And Emma Lawson reads that and sees like three things that resonate with her in that. It's just like, oh my gosh, like every but the world is judging me. And in reality, those, you know, that five minute read is written by somebody who has seen exactly 15 minutes of Emma Lawson, 10 minutes of Emma Lawson in the last 365 days and has just made a massive assumption that spans so many fucking different things that it's not even possible to to be correct about any of it. And it's exclusively for the purpose of here's some media, here's for someone else to read, here's for a spectator to gain interest in this sport is not for Emma Lawson. And the point of that is that like it's what you you alluded to Drew, it's the it's the work in the shadows. Unless there's been so, unless there's somebody attached to your fucking hip every single workout you do every single day who goes through the ups and downs, who knows, you know, when you're when you're when you had to put your cat down, when you, you know, and when when your relationship ended, when you had a, a really rough, you know, when a parent got sick or something like that, Unless somebody knows every single in and out of those situations over the last, you know, whatever it is, let's say year, training year, whatever it is, it's not a single goddamn person who could possibly ever understand you better than you do, which is why you are that judge, but it's having that other lever to pull where it's if 90% of the judgment is negative, I hate myself because I couldn't kick the soccer ball as well as Timmy, who is eight, you know, whatever it is we need to there there's work to be done on that other lever and like i'm i'm working on that like i have to do i do that personally all the time i'm i'm i i'm fucking heavy-handed on that right hand lever like judgment not a not a problem doing that but cutting slack that's a that's more difficult and it takes it takes time it takes practice truth and i still this is this is one of those unbelievable this is Thank one you. of those things that um, we've seen be the reason why an athlete can train so well for an off season, and then the reason why they're paralyzed at a competition. And that's one of the more challenging ones for me. And one of the ways that I try to work through it with athletes is the role that humility can play. So like, I'm not good enough. I need to get better. Like, for instance, one exercise that, that I do with a lot of athletes leading into semifinals of the CrossFit Games, is I send them a list of every movement that appears at the upcoming competition the most often, and they color code them based on strengths and weaknesses. And then we come up with a plan for what we call practice, like the things that we need to make sure pop up um, on on a pretty regular basis. And some really, really, really fit athletes go through, and it's just like red, 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 which is major weakness um, in terms of the color coding that I give them. And it's like, at what point 
is the thing that has created your fitness level what is holding you back from kind of showing it off, right? Like you're humble all the way up until, and it gets you incredibly fit because you know that you could always get a little bit better. But then that same voice that got you to that place is the one that doesn't let you go out and execute at that same level out on the competition floor. And I think this whole conversation that we're having is a way to enter that conversation with an athlete, with someone in your life where you can actually make a change, right? Like one of the goals when we have these bigger macro topics is for me to just have a couple of nuggets in there where it's like, what can we actually do about any of this stuff? We're all aware that it's here, that it's rampant, that some of us deal with it more than others, um, but what can actually be done? So if we're dealing with this humility thing, can we go back to identifying when judgment day is, what are the values we're trying to live up to, and who is actually allowed to judge us? Can we get back to that point? But it is just so fascinating that exactly what creates this beast athlete is the same thing that won't let them show everybody what they've been working on. Yeah, the, the thing that jumps to my mind is the, the ego thing. The other day I was talking to someone at the affiliate and I was like, you know, we often talk about the ego and give it sort of a negative connotation, but every once in a while, like having a little bit of that is a good thing because it propels you to do things that you might have not otherwise wanted to try or do. And this like willingness to be like, fuck it, I'll figure it out or fuck it, I can do that is definitely something we don't want to avoid 100%. There's some level of that that needs to stay inside of you. You just have to know, understand the application of it in a positive manner. And I think that's the part where if you haven't figured it out for yourself, that finding a support system around you that does understand that, it can help you basically use that as a tool for positive versus a, you know, a tool for negative is a tricky thing, but something that does happen, I think, with all high-level competitors. Like, you know, when you listen to the last dance or anything talking about high-level athletes, it's just like their ego is what separated them from everybody else. Like, I'm going to fucking destroy you because I know I can. And there's an element of that that has to be inside of a, a successful athlete. It's just understanding that like that same, that same person can destroy you if you let them and you can't balance it out with you know, humility on the other side of the equation. And we see that a ton in, the, the, in men's sports, right? You have the people with that massive ego that also work harder than everyone else. And then they basically have that like stack of proof and the I'm going to fuck you up like together. And that's like such a formidable force. But we also see all the time, I'm awesome. I don't try that hard and it falls apart. They are hoping like hell in the CrossFit sense that it's a particular movement or that they end up in the region that doesn't have 20 people that could qualify. Like there's so many things that they're trying to do to move the pieces around instead of just going in and, and doing that work. So when you have that ego and you actually go get to work, it's scientifically proven what happens when someone believes in themselves. Like they give people fake steroids, placebo steroids, and trained lifters get significantly stronger because they believe. You know, it's the, you know, you talk about last dance, it's the uh, Michael Jordan, what is it, secret stuff? He puts the water in the water bottle in Space Jam. Like I just talked about that yesterday with athletes. I said we were getting ready to pull one rep max deadlifts and bench press. I'm like, if you, whether you believe you can or you don't believe you can, you're right. So why not believe that you can fucking do it? Walk up to the bar. I think you can hit that. And all of a sudden they could. I'm like, what changed between five seconds ago and now is that you believe you could do it, like that you need to have that inside of you. And if I got to create that false sense for you so that you believe it, cool. All I literally said was do is I think you can do that. I didn't do anything outside of that other than put that belief into your head. And guess what? You did it right after. So there's a, there's a lot of power in that if you, can be, if you can sort of buy into that and truly believe that you're capable of doing something. Um, you know, you hear that from a lot of high-level performers. It's like, I just thought I could do it when no one, everyone else said I couldn't do it. And I did it because I believed I could. That, that really does exist. Can any of you think of an athlete, a professional athlete, who was like outwardly and memorably egotistical and arrogant but was bad? but was like objectively bad. Greg Hardy. So you got Drew. 
Who? Um, Greg Hardy. <clears throat> Not oh not <laughs> NFL Greg Hardy, but post NFL fight career Greg Hardy. Yeah, he brought that energy to a different sport and got his face smashed in. Yeah, he got knocked <laughs> out almost because his time. opponents weren't women. That's why. True. Yeah, I was gonna True. say he <laughs> fucking deserved it. the The world wanted that to happen. Yeah. That felt like a simulation thing. If karma's <laughs> karma's real, Greg Hardy fucking proved it. Um, <laughs> I mean. The, the the one that I bring up all the time that I think is fucking hilarious is O.J. Mayo was supposed to be the next Michael Jordan. And one of the things that happens that's not necessarily his fault is when you are, you know, on the cover of Sports Illustrated and the chosen one and all of that. Like, if you, you know, tell any fucking testosterone-filled 15-year-old that they're the greatest person on earth, that male, that's fucking dangerous, right? Um but there's a, a story of him talking shit to Jordan at his summer camp. This is like long retired Jordan. And basically not only is he going to be better than him in the future, but he's better than him now. And Jordan forced him to play one-on-one a bunch of times in front of the campers and just ate his fucking lunch. And he was known mm-hmm. throughout the NBA as like not a super hard worker. And his career was kind of journeyman. I would assume he averaged fucking 10 to 12 points a game like that sort of thing um and just hearing that kind of story and then there's the like your fucking brian boswell's <laughs> um yeah people like okay, that but so so i've never heard of and i've heard of oj 13 i've never heard of ted's points. i've never heard of the second one now name a couple athletes who did have that arrogance but were exceptional Tom Brady, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. <laughs> okay, so so my yeah. point, that, that was kind of where I was going with it, right? It's yeah. like, that's okay. Like, I get it. And I think I think those, like, every person that you just named, Drew, was the, like, you know, a, a generational talent. Someone that is just, that's just so far outside of the stratosphere of what any of us will ever comprehend that it's different. But the point was, is that the, that, egotistical nature was all was paired with a work ethic that was undergirded by a desire to win and you can argue about the methods in which you know someone like michael jordan you know treated teammates and management or coaches or whatever uh in order to get there and we can debate that but the point is is that these people were both talented and extraordinarily hard working probably could have used a little bit of the left lever, right? A little bit more maybe humility, but you it's could also argue that sports. maybe it, it's compli- it's complicated in team sports. I'm going to work and then way you harder the- than you. Uh, it's going to make me mad that you won't match that, right? Right. Or I'm going to work way harder than you, but like, okay, well, I'm not going to let him work that much harder. And all of a sudden now we have a, a, a more healthy push-pull between teammates. Right. But when yeah. it's an individual athlete who d- maybe doesn't have – the you know those prerequisites that we kind of talked about at a professional level this is now a person who is maybe teetering on embarking on that professional semi-professional athlete sort of mentality and it's like where the fuck do i go there's no roadmap for this like i don't uh, you know the roadmap for michael jordan was get, you know get cut as a sophomore then explode and never look back it's like i don't want to tell everybody the... again but he didn't get cut he just didn't make varsity I mean, he didn't make varsity. Whatever. <laughs> Same thing for what would have been what became sure. the greatest yes. basketball player of all time. Brady but, shit's even um, crazier. Brady got snubbed Bra- yeah. so many fucking times. Like you could argue that basically he's tall and has an above average arm, and then everything else was manifested by him, just by yeah. how fucking psychotic he was. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's it's crazy. That was the point to my rant. Final thoughts. Fuck. Uh, I mean, it, the thing that I, I think is most important. It. Yeah, you finally thought it. I think the most important thing is just <laughs> auditing your your relationships around people. If you feel like you're not in an environment that is conducive to reaching your goals and realizing that the outcome isn't really what you're after, it's a nice side effect of the journey you're on. That's just a hard thing to appreciate if you don't have the right perspective or if you're in a situation where that's not been valued you know growing up if everything in your life's been outcome you know outcome derivative i don't know if that's going to be the most 
beneficial thing for you if you can't figure out a way to audit that. So like le learning that this journey does require other people, but there are the right kind of extra people and the wrong kind of extra people is something that, you know, unfortunately you have to live your life to experience and figure out like who those people are. But I think that's a, the number one thing to help you understand like where you are in your journeys to having the right people around you. And, you know, it's not an exact science and it does take guess and check and it does figuring out, you know, year after year, do these people that are around me want what's best for me? And am I in a situation where I feel supported and that the, the help isn't conditional? I mean, that's probably the easiest way to identify whether or not you feel like you're with the right people is if that, that support is conditional. And if you feel like that, that's a clear sign to, to move on to something else. Yeah, I think my, my final thoughts and guidance here is for if, if, this, if this sort of topic is resonating with you, I think you should, it would benefit you heavily to, to talk to somebody. And I think probably just a, a close friend, confidant, someone, you know, someone you trust, whether it is, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's just, maybe it's a training partner or a peer or just like a friend. Um, but having these conversations and just kind of talking it through tends to make this a lot more clear for you. And if you're doing it on your own, I think just answering the questions of like, what do I want and what am I willing to do to achieve that goal? It's essentially trying to figure out like, what is, keep using the term, like what is the underbelly, what is undergirding your motivation to do what you want? Couldn't help himself like, three times. Which, which word? Which word do you like? Sherb gird. I think undergird. Under, I've heard undergird three times now. I've never heard undergird. it in my life to this to this day, but now I've heard it three You're times. You're welcome. Sherb's gonna say Thank optionality you. here in two seconds. Optionality. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is that a word. But you it it all of this this whole conversation starts on the idea that you not only know what you're what you're doing but why you're doing it i can't believe we went an entire podcast without sherb saying what's your why but uh it is a it, it there, there's a why? reason it gets said you know there's a reason there's a reason stereotypes are stereotypes and cliches are cliches but um you have to you have to have a good a legitimately good reason to be pursuing what you are and especially when it comes to something like a professional sport it's like like you are you have already embarked on trying to become the best of you know a fraction of a percentile of the top people in the world you all right drew on your just your face dog the beard congratulations <laughs> thank you you look pointing at your um, nose yeah I, I'm, I'm playing with the magic i got your nose <laughs> got your nose um yeah i i think one litmus test for the idea of these um hot burning fuels that seem like the right idea in the moment and then burn out versus finding something that sustains you is increasing the timeline to a much longer duration. So in the moment, again, day three of semifinals, you're like, okay, this is, this is it. Was this year worth it? That kind of thing. You zoom out to your career's over and you're, 46 years old and you ask yourself do i want to be able to go around with a t-shirt that says i came in seventh at the 2024 northeast semifinal, or do i want the majority of people that i interact with on a daily basis to think that i'm hardworking, generous kind whatever values you've decided fit that and that's one of the things that can help you really get over the hump on this stuff and realize that june 18th whenever you listen to this podcast um you have a lot of runway over the course of the year to decide now what those values are and what you want your legacy to be and what you want to accomplish within your life and then hold yourself to that standard over the course of the year and then that just extrapolates out to the human beings that you think have the ability to help you audit that over the course of the year if you do those things, then you can make it all the way back around to whatever your Super Bowl is, the Open, quarterfinals, semifinals, the CrossFit Games, Wadapalooza, Jim Bob's Backyard Throwdown, doesn't matter what it is, you can make it back around to those moments 
and go into it with, and here's the fucking cherry on top. You go into it knowing that you checked off all those boxes. We've seen those athletes that have spent the off season, not just working on themselves in the gym, but outside of the gym, they put on the best performance of their life out on the competition floor because they know that they went after what they needed to, to improve as a human being. And that just feels good. And a confident athlete goes out there and executes. So um, again, it brings us all the way back around to this idea of how you're going to execute, but you can be essentially a better person at the end of this season. And it can make you better at CrossFit completely independent of what you did in terms of training. That is correct. Did we do it? We done it. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. And thank you to our show sponsors, SharpenTheAxeCo.com. Use your favorite athlete code. You save 10%. They get 10%. Properfuel.co. Use the code word Misfit. MisfitAthletics.com to get signed up for off-season phase number two that is ongoing right now. If you are doing that, make sure you also join the Discord community, discord.gg forward slash Misfit Athletics. The coaches are in there. The virtual training partners are all in there. Get in there and participate. And last but not least, if you want to look bright red and wet, make sure you head to teammisfit.com and follow the summer running program and you can look and feel just like Pebble would. Bright red, wet no. <laughs> Wait for Sherb. Oh, are do you his. doing this today, Sherb? Nah, rest day. I actually retired from check? CrossFit. <laughs> I I did a uh, 300 pound bench press for the first time in my goddamn life, so I retired. Uh, I'm, yesterday we, was my retirement. buried the lead. That should have been yeah. what the podcast was about. Let's we'll talk should about the been. bench program next time. Fuck. Okay, see ya. <laughs> Peace. Bye.